life in this world may be meaningless. But still, cool things happen every now and then. Besides, you have to realize nothing's gonna change here, or back in our old world. But we still want to see for ourselves. Hold out your hand and ask to be friends, okay? It's easy, right? What feels like years ago, but was only actually four months ago, I published a video on Sunny Boy, a simply surreal anime that stole my heart from its first moments. It follows a class of students who go adrift. They find themselves in their school in this void. They develop powers, some useful and godlike, the ability to manipulate the entire world, and other powers, not so much. And this spawns a journey across a whole host of worlds and characters where time and space are of no concern, as they try to get back to their original world. But this world does have one seeming advantage. They can live forever. Here, there is no death. At least, not as we know it. It's a great anime, but it was something I struggled to write about. Recently, I gave it another go, wanting to dig into some of the specific stories told by its characters, only to get suckered back into the entire anime once more. But once felt like detached side stories now rang much clearer as parts that added to the whole. And that raised an issue. I had already covered the whole. Rereading through my script, though, I think I figured out why I had such a hard time writing about the anime. I'd analyzed the story, but purposefully stopped short of what made it all click into place. And I stopped because I didn't like what it was saying. In my first video, I reached the conclusion that everything was meaningless, but that we had power in that. Since life meant nothing, we didn't have to be afraid of ruining anything. We got to decide what meaning we gave to it. But there's another level to that. We will get into that and the anime, but first I want to cover why I missed the mark so much originally. I said last time that I'm a lot like early Nagara, I don't do much, I accept failure before I try, and fear keeps me down. The last one is what's important here today, I have a lot of fears, but more so than any other is death. Like any living thing, I have the sense to try and preserve my life as best I can, but this couples with some other factors to form a debilitating beast. I can hardly think of death, not just when my body stops functioning, but the nothingness that comes afterwards, the end of my consciousness. When I do think of it, that void that comes after living, I shut down. It's incomprehensible, like a computer that was overloaded, my brain can't compute what it's like. My day is ruined, I don't want to speak, or eat, or sleep. Somehow, my fear of death sends me into what seems like the closest thing to death I've experienced. You can see why I might not ever want to think about death. In this way, when people would say to me that death is what gives life meaning, I would always disagree vehemently. With the passion I reserve for things that usually matter a little bit more than petty philosophical musings. My argument was always that it was just an excuse to be boring and bland, to not adventure into the unknown. Surely with infinite time and endless possibility, we wouldn't cease to find meaning, we would become even more meaningful. How could we not with the endlessness of everything at our fingertips? Sunny Boy's creator, scriptwriter, and director Shinjo Natsume was the first person to not try and persuade me of their point by reinforcing what they had already said, but instead by building up what I had argued to show just how flawed it really was. I'm undecided on which way I feel on the issue of death and meaning as of now. I don't want to be someone who gives up their beliefs so readily, but one thing is clear. Sunny Boy makes one hell of an argument that death is what gives life meaning. One of the most striking episodes of the anime is its seventh. Separated from his class and his powers, Nagara is dropped into the Tower of Babel, a structure of legend with a twist. They're not building up, they're building down, carrying stone from the top of the tower to its base. Nagara's instant companion Futusaboshi explains, We're trying to get up to heaven. Really? Heaven is the only way out of this place and back to our own world, but it's more than that. We're hunting for treasure in the meantime. This is met with instant questioning by Nagara, but on their harsh work schedule there's little time to truly explain. Every day they wake up and build, with no exception and with no question. Some of them have even been doing this for thousands of years. Fujisaboshi further explains why they keep going, clinging onto the very things that Nagara so quickly questioned, saying, I don't think there are any castaways that really believe we're going to get to heaven someday. Even if it is all just BS, I'm happier chasing after that tiny glimmer of hope. Nothing else to it. 
Luckily, Nagara isn't one to accept such things, at least not after he met Nozomi. He escapes doing something very simple, walking up. That's all it took, just the will to move in the opposite direction to act on something he questioned rather than accepting it blindly when it makes no sense. Over thousands of years, this is something no one else did. It seems so simple, living these terrible lives, working an eternity away, why would no one else do this? They're trapped here forever in a replica of some of humanity's worst moments. With seemingly infinite worlds, endless time and possibility, this is how it ends up? One man ruling over others for his personal gain? With all that possibility, they ended up with the most human situation. Infinity has no guarantees, only possibilities. Like adding more faces to the dice, but one will always end to face up. Sometimes these possibilities are worse than what you'd get with a limited roll of the dice. And this is one of those times. It's forced labor not just for a lifetime, but for an eternity. Knowing this is their entire existence, no one tries that simple solution the Nagara does, the way he found out in just a few days. And precisely because it's an eternity is why they don't try. When your life is limited by death, you have an incentive to try and better it. You know that your years are limited, and every day spent somewhere you don't want to be is a wasted tick on the clock face. It's morbid, recognizing that so much of our lives can be wasted because we were put in a terrible situation from day one. Like those in the tower, we don't choose the situations, they choose us. Some people will spend their entire lives just trying to get out of that situation. It's a tragic tale that's sadly representative of many of our societies. Sadly, death is part of what motivates these actions. When you know that time is limited, you have an incentive to change the situation in whatever way you can. Toiling away somewhere horrendous for 10 years is a big deal when you only get 80 or so. You can put things off until tomorrow, shut your brain off for a moment and accept the repetition and labor, but tomorrow will come. Infinity has no tomorrow. 2000 years may seem like a much bigger deal than 10, but not when you have an infinite number of years. At that point, it's not even a discernible percentage of your life. Sure, it sucks, but you can just deal with it tomorrow. After all, eventually it will all be a speck in the past, long forgotten not even 1% of your life at the end of the day. Your body will heal leaving no scars, your mind will fog covering the pain. It's no big deal living without meaning like this, just serving someone else's. Precisely because they'll have the time to search for meaning, they have no reason to look for it now. It can always be deferred to the tomorrow that will never come. This travesty bearing the name Babel exists because life here is limitless. Again, it's morbid, but think about it. If you had forever to find your purpose, would you search for it right now? Or would you just go with the flow, seek pleasure, or work away for a bit because it's easier than looking for meaning? Even with limited time, we push difficult tasks off for the future, but they eventually will be done. With no end, there just is no eventually. I know a lot of people just like you, always pretending they're so busy. In my experience, those folks usually end up never having much to do at all. Hell, you just want a scapegoat. Gonna blame him so you feel better? So why are we doing any of this then? Cause there's nothing else. A couple of episodes later, we're introduced to the twins, So and Seiji, a pair that's revealed not to actually be twins, but a man and his copy. Except for one minuscule thing, a single strand of hair. Seiji has one more hair than So. They've counted again and again and again, and they always reach the same result, even documenting it. This sparks a war that lasts thousands of years. Each one has a power they call reverse, the ability to return things to a previous state. This allows them to repeat their feud again and again with the same conditions, no end in sight in the beginning long gone. They meet to duel in various ways, but So always loses to Seiji. Miss Aki, someone else adrift and someone impersonating one of their teachers, returns to their world with a gift, this toy gun with the ability to kill or more likely to simulate death in some way. One for each of them, and they have one final duel. Despite firing noticeably after, So still wins, watching himself disintegrate before his eyes. Distraught from this ultimate victory, he says, Honestly, I don't know. It feels kinda hollow. I've lost my purpose. Before turning the gun on himself and ending his other life. It's an asinine feud, wasting so many years, hundreds of lifetimes on a singular hair in a world where nothing ever changes. 
With infinity at their fingertips, this is what they end up doing. Imagine fighting with a friend over a single strand of hair. If you spent even an hour on it, it would feel like a waste of time, and you'd probably feel stupid to even think to make it a big deal. But that's only because our time is limited. We have to pick and choose what we spend it on. We're forced to decide what's important to us and what isn't because we can't do everything. When you remove this restriction, it doesn't allow us more time for the important things, it just makes it so there are no important things. Everything can receive the same amount of time, an endless amount. A single hair and world peace are of the same scale. Everything can be important, so nothing is important. But they'd still be able to move on, right? Is there a, really an issue of spending thousands of years on something like this with infinite time? They could still do anything and everything and make this a small percentage of their eternity. But as humans, putting aside whether it would be good or bad to do everything, do we even have the desire or the will to? At the end of the day, they fought over this hair by their own decision. It was their choice to start and to keep doing it. They reached the natural conclusion that one of them had one more hair. In a normal world, it would end there and you'd move on to a new purpose. But here, there was no moving on. Endless possibilities also means every possibility is endless in itself. It doesn't just mean something new to move on to, it means there's something to keep pursuing until the end of time. There's nothing about infinity that says we'll do more than one thing. It's just as possible that we pick one meaning for our life and chase that forever because that's easier than the alternative. Change is hard and here there's no need to grow or change. When So finally ends the conflict, he feels hollow and purposeless because he is. The realization sets in that his shallow, fragile purpose has ended, that with limitless potential, there was no more meaning to his life than that single hair, even after thousands of years. Humans are limited. Infinity is incomprehensible. Sure, like in the tower, we can keep saying, save it for tomorrow when we go day by day. But what about if we do finally decide to make that change, and we look at unlimited time with limited brains? Of course he's empty. He wasted thousands of years fighting over a single hair because there was no marker of importance. He didn't kill himself here, he was already dead. This shot is just confirming what he had realized. I also want to point out something else I noticed about this fight and some other details we passed over. Miss Aki says to So, You've known for quite some time, haven't you? That Seiji has no chance of winning? This seems like it's out of left field. It would seem to contradict everything we've said so far, given he's lost every duel but their final one. But it only seems that way. She said he keeps losing to himself, not to Seiji. Let's look at their fight closer and pay attention to the number of hairs and their position. For this one shot here, the twins flipped sides. So moves from the left side to the right. This could easily be an animation error or a breaking of the 180 degree rule, but what if it isn't? When So lands the final blow with his toy gun, he says this. And just now, that was called a skip. I think his power is something other than reverse, this skip he mentions. Something that allows him to somehow keep losing on purpose, like the ability to change positions with Seiji. It could also explain how he fires afterwards, but is unharmed for some time in their final duel. It would make Miss Aki's comments make sense. I think he knew his copy Seiji could never win, so he made himself keep losing. Why? Why would someone do this? Maybe to prolong the fight, internally crying out that he hoped one day he would be able to overcome himself? That he could witness himself do so as proof. That this replica could grow or change in some way that it had the potential to even if the form he took right now somehow didn't that his character had some ability to. It's like some kind of evidence that he could be better than what he is right now. But that day never comes. He's left with only the knowledge that he wasted all of those years, and he has left himself with nothing. With infinity at his fingertips, he never once allowed himself to be better than this. He never had an incentive to change, to actually try and win the battle against himself. So he never did, and it leaves him hollow. Lifetimes before any of these stories, though, there's Yamabikos, the once human turned dog who accompanies our main characters. Once his class went adrift, he left them, finding more comfort in aimless wandering than in their company. Eventually, he stumbled across Kodama's world, a bright girl who forced him to interact and eventually began to break down his cold exterior. He began to feel happy in this world for once, 
but it was short-lived, as a man named War was found on their land, bringing with him a plague of carbuncles. The people would become covered in these sores, which grew and eventually took over their entire bodies. They don't technically die, instead changing form, turning into nothing more than stone, a workaround for death in this world. And it's not quite true that War brought the plague. He reveals to Yamabiko that it wasn't his doing, but actually Yamabiko's power. Aren't you curious why you're the only one who's not sick and covered in carbuncles? It's because this world is entirely your creation. The ability to materialize what was inside my mind, that was my power. And what it did was remove everyone else, leaving just him and Kodama. This is never confirmed, but I think the reasoning for this manifestation is that he wanted to be alone with Kodama. He loved her, but he had an inability of expression. And she, on the other hand, was viewed as perfect, the one who allowed her classmates in this tag-along to live such comfortable lives. He was just some stray that found his way in. I think he manifested like this because he wandered aimlessly, and with infinite time in that wandering, he never became someone who could love. He saw himself as fit to serve her, not to love her. His form is likely a result of this and its power. A stray who wandered in to serve someone better than him, believing she could never love him, he changed his form to be one that couldn't be loved like a human. His desires and meaning were locked in his own head forever, and it led to loneliness and ruin. All of this, his form, the plague, wouldn't have happened if what was in his head had some reason to be put into words. But this is a world which has no reason to take those risks. You might say it's the opposite in this endless wealth of time, and without death it's the perfect place to take risks. But is it really, especially when it comes to love? If Yamabiko's time was limited, there's an incentive. He would have a reason to tell Kodama that he loved her, because he could die with the regret that he never did. But with infinite time, there's no reason for desire to ever overcome fear. If they say no, you didn't miss out on a lifetime with them, you missed out on an eternity with them. Death provides the basis to find meaning, to find love. But it's more than this. Eventually Kodama dies as well, and Yamabiko is left with nothing. Telling a story to Mizuho and Nagara, he recognizes that Kodama had the same desire as him, expressing a wish to travel to the places he told her about together. The signs were there, how much she tried for him, and the treatment she showed someone who was so harsh and so rude at first, the fact that despite all of that, she kept trying to help him. But he had no recognition of this importance until it was gone. Without loss, he had not just no incentive to risk himself for love, but he had no idea that he could or even should. He had no idea what was important and worth risking for. It's not just our own death that provides limitation and meaning, it's others. Eventually, they'll be gone and we'll be left with just the memories of them. The joy that we shared a meaning or the grief that we never tried to. For Yamabiko, his memories are only of assisting and serving and never of loving. In a world which has never known loss, he had no reason to push for love. But I never opened my eyes to see that. All she wanted was to walk by my side. But... I'm done with all that. Okay, understood. I guess you could say she didn't want to relive memories with him. She wanted them to create a future together, go into the unknown. But loss is eventually introduced to this world in a few ways. One of them leads Nozomi to her fate. She accompanied their classmate Azakaze to kill war, a task he was given by God. He was told to invent death in a world without death. He succeeds, and just after killing War, Nozomi falls from the cliff crumbling. But once Asakaze had invented death, there was no way to stop hers. His power would normally allow it, he could manipulate the world, but with death, fate took its toll. Nozomi was always chasing death, and it finally caught up with her. Eventually, the news reaches Nagara and Mizuho, where they decide to hold a funeral for her. And there's a very touching note about Nozomi's funeral, in a similar vein to love, but about how we make it meaningful. It's a depressing scene despite the beautiful sights and upbeat tune. The fact that they put so much effort into making all this, crafting it by hand, and then getting in touch with everyone too, and then the, none of them bothered to show up. Even with unlimited time, they didn't bother to make time to remember Nozomi, while Nagara and Mizuho were working away to make this for them so they could remember her. The note that hits the hardest about all of this is that Mizuho could have simply ordered all these things. She has the power to order anything she wants. 
The tents, the meals, the decorations, all of it could have been ordered. But they didn't do this, and it was touching that they didn't. They decided it was important that they use their own time to do so. While they may have still had all the time in the world, I think it still says a lot that Nagara, the boy who did nothing, and Mizuho, the girl who ordered everything, limited themselves for this moment. All those objects are just things that exist. A crab, or blue and white striped tents, or paint on a canvas, none of them are any different from the sand they sit upon. Things, and nothing more. But they gave them meaning through their sacrifice of time and effort. Without death, these moments would grow infinite, these things could mean anything. The fact they did this would eventually lose its meaning in the endlessness of everything, and the fact that they would have had no reason not to do it. The fact that they could have given everything to her memory, rather than having to pick and choose what was right for it. It's not just how we use our time, it's how we use it for others, and how we decide what meaning they have or had for us. Eventually, Nagara and Mizuho's once companion Raj Dhani returns for this funeral after a long voyage to see all of the worlds he could. With relative time, what was a couple of years for them became 2,000 for him, and in that time he'd seen all kinds of times and places across these worlds. Presenting the most striking story within the anime, he tells of a peaceful world with one outlier. Among a group who cast aside their worldly pleasures and resigned to pacifism, there was an inventor who hated them and their ideals taking advantage of their passive nature to experiment on them in service of one goal, to invent death. He saw it as the only way to break up the static nature of this world. Eventually, he succeeds, but not in the way you'd think. Rather, he alters himself so much that who he was no longer exists. He comes to peace with the world he was so angry at, where he once chased endlessly after goal, his desires are now gone. He no longer seeks what his life was formerly defined by. He became the same as everyone else in this world. In that way, as an individual, he succeeded in finding death. Is this really any different from the death we all experience? When our worldly desires are gone and when we no longer have a purpose, when we're simply a body existing the same as everyone else. These deaths are one and the same. We can die when we're still alive as many in the show had before this. The workers in the tower who will live forever chasing dreams they know not to be true, like shooting stars or finding treasure, because it's easier to fit in and follow than to walk the opposite path. The twins who fought for years over something so pointless, static as possible, and devoid of real purpose. War who traveled around these worlds bringing death and rewarding himself for it. Eventually his purpose ran out like everyone else, and they find him falling forever in a huge scar on this world. They're all dead. None of them will ever grow or change again. Who they are is the same as anyone and everyone else. Rajdani elaborates on this from his observations, giving one of the greatest minutes of dialogue in anime that I'll play here as unabridged as possible. As you keep building experiences and see the world, something changes inside you. There's a kind of homogenization you can observe in all things. Individualized meanings become more diluted. What's me? is falling away. Ultimately, I'll become nothingness. The soul is just a human construct. The self exists for no reason, and it ultimately ceases to be. Since it is meaningless, then this moment of becoming is a precious and beautiful thing indeed. That one moment belongs to that person alone. This is where I think the anime begins to wrap up its message. The words, that moment of becoming is something precious indeed, continue to stick with me. Death forces us to grow and change for our betterment, makes us decide carefully on how we spend our time, and gives us the means to recognize what's important and what isn't through life. Because life doesn't go on forever, we have to figure out exactly how we want to spend it, who we want to spend it with. We have to make that time special because everyone else's life is just as fragile as our own. We have to push for it to be what we want if it isn't. Death makes us decide what we want to do with the greatest gift that can possibly be. What defines us and what makes us distinct from everyone else. What we spend our limited time doing out of everything that can be done. Those are the things that make us, that give us meaning. With Infinity, Rajdani explains that everything is diluted and eventually we would lose ourselves. If we did everything the same as everyone else, then who would we be? We would all be the same, our lives and experiences meaningless when compared to the collective. We would be the tower workers, the twins in war. We would all die the inventor's death. The moment where we recognized we are nothing. But death is that moment of becoming, where we're solidified not as everything, but as something indeed. Mm -hmm.
to make this lesson even more poignant, it's capped off with a scene where Nagara cries over the loss of Nozomi, the one who pushed him to be or do anything in this world. Without her, he would have had not just never the chance to go home, or not just found his power, or not have seen such amazing sights, he would have never even gotten up off the floor. The life he had here was because of her. Rajdani sits next to Nagara as he cries and says, I've learned much about life and the nature of the universe. However, all I know to do for a friend crying in despair is sit beside them. After 2000 years witnessing all of the pain of these worlds, there's nothing more he can do. He's seen so much, but can do nothing for this pain. I think there's more of a reason for this than just human shortcomings. There's one thing we all experience at some point that's unique to all of us, and that's the pain of loss. When someone else has died. When their being ceases and they're solidified as someone unique. They were someone who hadn't existed before, and someone who will never exist again. Because of this unique nature, the same thing that gives life meaning, there's no way to ever truly comfort that kind of loss, even after 2,000 years of witnessing it. A testament to the power of death, the very thing that solidifies meaning through limitation, creates a pain so unlimited, it could never be comforted more than this. <laughs> We're really glad that you're okay, man. Nozomi is much more to the story than just loss, though. She's the baseline and the end point of the lesson. As we said, she pushes Nagara to do anything at all. The series opens on him lying on the floor, content to do nothing with his now limitless time. Both before and after they went adrift, he had no purpose, no meaning. He's an expert in giving up, often deciding he can't do something before he's hardly tried, and returning to doing nothing. He keeps waiting for his purpose to reveal itself to him, but Nozomi corrects him. It's not like people are worth anything just because they were born. Sure, there's some value in the life we've been given, but if it came bundled with a purpose, we'd be letting someone else decide our fate. This is the mentioned baseline, the idea that we need to search for meaning at all, and why death is necessary for that meaning. If we come with one, then what's the point of anything? We'd just be living out things according to someone else's script. Our lives wouldn't be our own. We have an example of this in the series in Hoshi. His power is the ability to hear God's voice, and he uses it as a form of determinism. Everything is written so everyone else is wasting their time on silly pursuits. All he does is follow the voice that's never wrong. But look and where this gets him. He ends up abandoned by the voice of God with nothing more than what it told him that he couldn't go back home. But as we learn later, this wasn't because of God's will, but outside interference. They could have returned home and essentially did succeed. They were home, but the will of Mizuo's guardians wanted her to stay in a world without death. They made it look like they had failed. And with the idea that God's word was true, they all leave, content that there was some truth in what he said. Had Hoshi not listened to the voice, would things have ended differently? Could they all have found meaning? Maybe not, but they at least had the possibility to. There would have been a meaning to his actions if nothing else, one he decided for himself. We can never be certain if fate exists or not, so why act like it does? All that means is we aren't living our own lives. That we're taking a sure path for nothing more than the fact that it is sure. Is that meaningful? Nozomi says, If I just took the safe options and did exactly as I'm told all the time, I wouldn't look back and say, good job me. We all end in the same place, whether in this world or that world, eternity or death. So the only option is to make it so you can look back and say to yourself, good job. Nagara, after being pulled by Nozomi to witness this amazing sight here, begins an exchange with her. Don't you ever get scared? Scared and anxious. Then how? To be honest, it's why I do stuff like this. Nozomi is all about breaking the rules and taking risks. When they first meet properly, before they went adrift, she's on the school roof tearing up her textbook. Once they are adrift, she denounces the student council forcing the rules on everyone in this new world, and she's harshly against Hoshi's determinism explored above. Yet she's one of the few who remains focused on returning to the real world, where everyone else who wanted to before has moved on. Given the chance, everyone else stays in this world. But this girl, the one most representative of possibility, is the one who not only wants to return, but makes doing so possible. When she dies, she leaves behind a compass, 
one that Nagara and Mizuho used to find their way home, in addition to all their work and planning, of course. But why would this girl, built on the idea of risk and rule breaking, want to return to a world where risk had consequence and rules were in place to need breaking? Well, that actually answers the question quite well. Without consequence, there is no risk, and without rules, there is no breaking them. Put another way, there's no marker for the things that are meaningful or worthwhile. The risks we take to define what's important to us, the things worth risking over, the thing Yamabiko never did. The rules we break are the ones we find unjust or that stand in the way of our meaning. They let us know our fight has importance that we are ourselves. The ones we follow can do the same thing, following purposeful restrictions in the name of something greater. From these limitations, she becomes someone unique, as we all do. Her power was to see a light, what she interpreted as the way to return to their world. When she grabs it, they happen to return, but something else also happens right then. The world they return to is one where she's dead. I don't think that light was her way home, I think it was her death. And the compass she leaves behind, her power holdover, is the item that leads her friends back to a world with death. Once they return, the needle goes wild, pointing in every and any direction where before it stayed true. Besides the literal pull it would have to have felt to this world to function, it's also like it's pointing to meaning or purpose. In the world of endless possibility, it stayed in one direction, forever locked on something to follow. But Nozomi was the one who said we have to find our own meanings. Her compass wouldn't lead others to their meaning, no, it would lead them to where they could find it, and let them make the limited decisions that define them as someone with purpose. Once they rejoin the real world, it points in any and every direction. It no longer gives them something to follow, and they have to find their own path to move on. In a way, pointing nowhere in particular is more meaningful. In this world, it was limited, only guiding them in one direction where they could find meaning. Here, it's pointing everywhere. In our world, with death, they have endless opportunity for meaning, one unique to them because of limitation. She led them where she led herself, to death, the reason to ever find meaning. <laughs> Remember what you told me? You said we couldn't change the world. The only thing we could do was roll the dice. <laughs> it's important to go back to the beginning for something else knows me said though. You can't make the world fair. It never really has been anyway. Something equally true both of their world and this world. Some people receive powers that lead them to be chosen by God. Others have useless ones requiring them to work for what they have, or like in the tower, they either don't have them or refuse to recognize them. Nozomi herself is the best example. Her power is simply leading to death. It's not fair, the same as our world. Some here are born with powers of their own, influence, money, health, while others lack those things. Because of this, some people get more choice in their meaning, their options are less limited because they don't have to spend time avoiding the death that comes from a lack of power. All of this is to say, death isn't fair. Until we decide to change things as a whole, it never will be. As we see from thousands of years of both worlds, we have yet to change the things that do need that changing. We keep allowing death to be unfair. But this doesn't diminish our meaning here today. The fact that it is unfair may even make it more impactful. We can't fear the inevitable, it's unfair and can take us any time, so we have to be aware of it and we have to find our meaning in that time. In short, we can't be like Asakaze. He became endlessly special in this world, falsely heralded as the savior and given tasks directly from God. Here he was something special that no one else was. But these are some of his final words. I'm the only one left at this point. There's nothing here for me. Despite recognizing this, despite stating it to them, he stays. He stays with the people who blindly followed, the people who constantly blamed others rather than searching for themselves, the people who toil away with no purpose, the people who were fine doing nothing for eternity, all the people who never change, who have no meaning. This world is described as stasis because it is. Physically, they don't age, heal, or grow, but they still get hungry. They still have the drive to seek pleasure, but none to better or to preserve themselves. Eventually, they all find death the same as Nagara and Mizuho will. The only difference will be more time and a lack of meaning when they finally do die. When they become like war. 
Azakaze stays because facing death is a fear too great, finding a purpose outside of the powers he was given is too hard. Recognizing all of this, he chooses existence without meaning out of this fear, and it will never lead him to something better, only to something longer, something less meaningful, the stasis of this world. He's the warning of the series. Death is unfair, it's cruel and unique in such a way it will hurt us all in awful ways that no one will ever understand. But if we simply ignore it, then eventually there will be nothing left for us here either. Nagara is the reverse. He enters this world in stasis, but leaves it outside of it. Where most of the anime is showing the danger of limitless possibility, he lays down the evidence that possibility itself isn't bad. Before they went adrift, he was someone who would likely live his entire life depressed and alone. His home is full of garbage and his mother doesn't care to attend his graduation. He's alone because of his situation and he learned to keep himself alone. To declare he was a failure before he even started. He walks past birds dying on the sidewalk because what can he do? When he returns from this world, almost all of these facts are the same. His home is still a wreck. His mother still doesn't care. He's still not popular or exceptional. He still shies away from most things and baby birds will still die on the sidewalk but he doesn't walk past them. There's not much he can do. He can't bring them home if he's not allowed, but he sets up a home for them at the train station and checks on them when he can. He does what he's able to with limited possibilities. He finally recognizes possibility because he went adrift, having a space where he could learn from others, interact with them and figure out who he was and all of that, and it changed him. Without a taste of everything, he would have had nothing. Nagara is the idea that possibility is good, and the world they want to drift in is the idea that endless possibility is dangerous. But in line with this, there's something else to be said about how he returns and immediately settles back into the toil of daily life with just those minor changes and a new mindset. He and Mizuho muse that they and everyone else was correct, they can't change this world. I think people do have the power to change the world, but not in an instant. Change is a gradual process, one that has a lot of overlap with the search for meaning. Sometimes we don't have the energy to search because the world is unfair, or simply we don't think we can, or maybe we might not even want to. And that's fine, there's nothing that says we have to find meaning, just that we can, and no matter what, in some small way the finite world we have allows it to be so, and allows it to be ours. And how he describes he and Mizuho's journey home is no different from all of this. He says, We can't really change anything, but only the things that can happen do happen. All we're doing is re-rolling the dice. That's what all of this has been about. The journey of returning to a world with death is the process of beginning to find meaning. A roll of the dice that can't be undone. One you might begin to question if it happened or if it was right like he and Mizuho do. The recognition that they have to live forever with this decision, accepting the risk and the consequence. Nothing really changes in their world because that wasn't the point of all of this. The world is unfair and they couldn't change it. All they did was what Nozomi led others to do, to begin to find meaning. The dice were rolled and now they all have one face up. That's what they're playing with, the limited possibility of their role. All that's left is to look at it all and decide, what is my life going to be from here? How will I pick and choose what's important and what isn't, through risk and reward, through love and loss, to make something that can end as mine and mine alone? It's not happy, just like the lives they lead when they return. There's no guarantee of happiness, there's no guarantee of anything, except that one day we will all be no more. So don't focus on the end. We all fear death, but don't let it stop you. Don't let it leave you with nothing more here for you. It's about a journey, our one journey. The one we give meaning to. Our lives are just getting started. The road ahead is full of twists and turns. Thank you for spending some of that time, some of that search for meaning with me here today. For showing me that something so meaningful to me is to you and others as well. I really do appreciate that. And I hope you'll do me that honor again sometime soon.